Want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? Welcome to Rage Against the Mainstream, your full spectrum source for all things music, insight, and opinion. My name is Bill, and I'm joined here with Connor and Steve. Yo. Yo. All right, so if you guys are listening to us now, we'd like to thank you for subscribing to us on iTunes. We've now made it to iTunes podcast. We couldn't do this without your support and your help, so thank you very much. So uh, I heard that you have something interesting, Steve, to tell us. Yeah, I'm, I got a couple new updates with some uh, familiar bands. Uh, first is Amon and Marth. I've been mentioning them the past several weeks. Uh, May 3rd, they actually just dropped a new album. It's called Berserker. Um, it is available as well on iTunes. Um, it's a 12-song LP. It's very good. I mean, it's traditional Amon and Marth, very basic, but very good. Uh, Bad Religion also dropped their uh, new album as well. It's called Age of Unreason. Uh, both these albums were dropped on May 3rd. I definitely recommend them. Uh, but the biggest update, um, one of my favorite bands, Tool. Ooh, Long tool. time been coming since their 2006 album, 10,000 10, Days. Days. Yeah, it's been a long time, but they actually played a show May 5th um, in Jacksonville. It was a festival. It was the Welcome to Rockville Festival. They performed two new songs. Oh, wow. It's been a long time since it's also been discussed of, like, you know, Danny Carey doing the drum tracks, Adam Jones doing the uh, instrumentals as well, and then Maynard coming in for vocals. But the two new songs, one was called Descending, one was called Invincible. I'm going to tell you right now, I listen to both of these tracks. They're obviously live recordings, like off of someone's cell phone, but you yeah. can clearly hear them, uh, hear them, especially with the way phones are today. Both tracks remind me completely of like Lateralis. They're very good tracks. That's awesome. Um, I definitely recommend looking both of those up. You can probably find them on YouTube. I actually saw the article about it. Uh, still no real information on the album dropping, but you know that's definitely something to look into. It's a step in the right direction. I'm so excited for it, dude. Absolutely excited. That's for awesome. It. Yeah, man. I'm excited to hear new music from them. Oh, my God. I'm dying for it, dude. It's been 5,082 days since 10,000 days. We're halfway there. <laughs> On this day in music history. On this day in music history, in 1970, the Beatles documentary Let It Be made its theatrical debut. It was the last Beatles film. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of cool that the Beatles made movies, I guess. I'll stand by the fact that the Beatles are highly overrated. I agree. Yeah, but yeah. I, I wouldn't mind seeing some pop stars today in, in movies. Like, I wouldn't mind seeing Jay Z in more movies. Or, yeah, that would be really cool. Something like that. What do you mean? You don't get enough of Ludacris in the Fast and the Furious movies? We well, got MGK that was in uh, the dirt as a start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That movie wasn't that coming great. Back. But still. Eight Mile. Yeah, but that's, it's been a while. You think Get Rich or Die Trying came out after that? Yeah, Get Rich or Die Trying. Yeah. Stevie Wonder has a double whammy for uh, this week in music history. He was born in 1950, and in 1971, when he turned 21, is by law released from his recording contract and given one million of the 30 million he has earned while at his former label. Could you imagine being owed 30 million dollars by the time you're 21? And only getting a million of it, though? Oh, yeah, only getting nothing. Well, <laughs> well shit, I mean, at, this point, dollars, I, at this point, at this point, I'd take anything. Yeah, you know, and I like to say that, too, but at the same time, you think of how much work he had put in at that point. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? To be owed that much money, of course. Well, yeah, think about how much for... money he made for other people. Well, yeah, that's the yeah. sad part, dude. Yeah. Motown was fucking raping them, dude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was unbelievable what they did to those artists, and I mean, they made a killing off that. I mean, obviously, it would be a lot harder to be able to do something like that today from uh, an industry like that. But yeah, to be owed $30 million and only get a million... Yeah, I mean, I'm grateful for a million fucking dollars, but dude, come on. That's yeah. realistic. A testament to the dominance of Motown would be that our next event in, on this day in music history mm -hmm. is the Jackson 5. Ooh. A concert at RFK Stadium in Washington, D.C. Uh, unfolded a riot when impatient fans began smashing bottles in the parking lot. 50 fans were injured and 43 were brought to jail. Could you imagine that mad over the Jackson 5? I wanted to I wanted to read more about this story, but I had a I had a hard time finding stuff. Um, sounds crazy. I I thought Guns N' Roses were the only ones that started riots at their concerts. 
Yeah. <laughs> I, and it, I love how it starts as like with the 1974. It's an unlikely riot. I mean, that's the best way to describe it because I can't <laughs> picture the group rioting outside of a Jackson 5. Yeah, really. Concert. Like, it would like be like music, a mosh pit of the beat. Say, the, like, like, you know, with the PC. wiggles. Yeah, dude. We were talking about like Woodstock 99. Like, Limp Biscuit gave that vibe of like heavier music. So people, yeah. energy was like you already can on it. edge. Yeah, but you're going into a Jackson 5 concert. All yeah, it's like it's going to weird. see uh, Leon Bridges or some shit and trying and like. George Michael <laughs> Uh, someone a riot unfolds outside. Yeah, dude, that's funny. In 1978, four years later, after eight weeks at number one, "Night Fever" by the Bee Gees is finally bumped off, and it was replaced by Yvonne Elliman's "If I Can't Have You," another song written by the Bee Gees and also featured on the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack with John Travolta. Um, I mean. If you're even a casual music fan, I mean, you're probably aware of the, Bee Gees. the dominance of the Bee Gees. Well, that Saturday whole disco Night scene Fever was, yeah, dude. yeah, seventies. Yeah, that was like the uh, that was the epitome the watershed of the 70s, moment dude. of disco. Yeah, that was the absolute epitome of the. Well, 70s. it is kind of funny that both of those songs are both on the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack and both written by the well, Bee Gees and both at number one. And yep. Bee Gees, I think, had at least two other songs from that soundtrack that were number one. I think. Staying alive and yeah, uh, mm-hmm. I forget what the other one's called, but they had another one too. It was before uh, Night Fever. I, I don't want, want nobody, baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's just one thing, dude. Regardless of how everyone feels about that scene, you know those songs. I, yeah, know I love those the Bee Gees songs. when I was oh, a kid. Yeah. yeah, dude. Staying alive was one of my favorite songs. As They're hitting machines. Like that. That's what that. That's what they do. That's it. <laughs> And it's funny, everybody that could hate on that type of music and those bands, like, dude, if they had the opportunity to do that type of stuff and make the money that they did, of there's course. No way oh my god. Struck down the street in fucking <laughs> bell bottom suits. And I'm sure shit. George Corpse Grinder would humble himself to sing for the Bee Gees if he was given the opportunity. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> in 1985, the Parents Music Resource Center, also known as the PMRC, holds a meeting in a Washington church where they stir up support for their agenda, a rating system for albums and concerts like those used for movies, and also to keep offensive album covers out of view in record stores. Their efforts lead to warning stickers on albums with offensive lyrics. That's ridiculous. I mean, I understand it. Yeah, I know why the censorship that went. I mean, it was really crazy. Some of the censorship, especially coming up. Yeah, dude. Um, Like I remember, even like specifically, and I mean, I understand. Like I just mentioned, like Corpse Grinder, but with like Cannibal Corpse, I remember they always had like the album and then always the alternative cover. Yeah, you know, and I get that well, the, to a certain the, extent. Yeah, I was gonna say those guys are a totally that's different what I'm story. Saying, I was using that because it was cool because it's always mm-hmm. nice to like own the original. But then I remember like just so but, many albums. Like, dude. why was like Twisted Sister censored? Or like, Undertow. yeah, that was just stupid. Yeah, like think of Undertow by Tool, man. Nothing, like, yeah, like even uh, like Motley Crue. Yeah. Shout of the Devil had a parental advisory sticker. Nirvana, yeah. never mind, didn't have a parental sticker, but it had like a sticker over the dick yeah, right. that uh, <laughs> it said like featuring Smells Like Teen Spirit yeah. and whatever else. Yeah. Yeah, the PMRC definitely went way overboard. Yeah. Black Hole Sun in 1994 was released during this week. It was the second single off their album, Super Unknown. Soundgarden had pretty much broken through in 91 with Bad Motorfinger, yeah. but most would argue that uh, Super, Super Unknown, Unknown was the true breakthrough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it debuted at number one. Black Hole Sun was a huge hit. Spoon Man was a huge hit. Dare I Try to Live, My Wave. Yeah, yeah there's so many. I'm a Super, Super Unknown, Unknown guy. Yeah, I'm a Super Unknown guy. Yeah, Super Unknown I think that's my yeah. by them. Like, Bad Motorfinger has really good songs on it, but the Super Unknown is pretty much... 15 songs of greatness well it's funny too because that's another band for instance like black hole sun i think it was on the fucking game rock band or something and there's always like you hear a song like like in bloom by nirvana was on rock band as well and then you hear these songs and they become like almost the hated songs mm-hmm. like like so i remember it was i forget who showed me but someone showed me jesus christ pose it was off a of bad motor finger i think it was like what louder than love the first album or the second album second album yeah those that's what i kind of got into with mo- uh with you know sound guarded and jesus christ pose being off a of bad motor finger that allowed me to go back and listen to like all the tracks on the super unknown in that album I, dude that was so good yeah, I probably would honestly at this point take if I had to go to a desert island and take an album with me. It had to be uh, one Soundgarden album, one grunge album, one grunge album might be super unknown. Out of all the grunge albums, mm-hmm. I might take over super a unknown, utero. Never, never mind, utero. Yeah. Wow. Wow, dude. That says a lot. Just yeah, that's 
This Super is growth for Connor to get away from Nirvana as being the mecca. <laughs> Holy shit, dude! Really, you're you're standing by this? Yeah, I think so. Because I mean, like in utero is like, dude, you're never gonna be able to hear milk it again. <sighs> I mean, no scentless apprentice. Well, what about no? Uh, I don't know, man. This is a stupid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just. <laughs> um, <laughs> island, man. It's either a super unknown or a utero. Island, I'll man. say that. <laughs> super unknown moved up in the ranks. It is a time. pretty good album. Uh, I remember uh, over seeing. The years. I remember seeing Soundgarden when they played in Camden. They were touring on King Animal. Yeah, and you were pissed okay. they didn't play Black. Yeah, Hole they didn't Sun. play Black Hole Sun. <laughs> That's actually pretty cool. I'm kind of glad they didn't do that. No, nah, it, it kind Gordon of pissed me off. Dude. I know. Well, that's the thing. I think that's interesting because you think of a lot of bands, they go out there and there are certain songs, like for instance, Metallica, 99% <laughs> of the time will play Enter Sandman. Yes. You know, and for them to not play Super uh, or, or Super Because uh, Metallica is not song, badasses anymore. That's true. We've covered this in that's previous true. podcasts. At yeah. length. <laughs> At very detailed length. Um, but yeah, I would, I'd be kind of pissed off too if they didn't play that, dude. And it, it was just raining. For a set. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. So. It was raining. It was wet, dude. That's it probably was why cold. they didn't feel like fucking playing anymore. They were underneath a roof. In 2003, Tommy Chong of Cheech and Chong and other bunch of other stuff actually um, pleads guilty to selling drug paraphernalia over the internet, water bongs and bowls and could you glass imagine getting pipes a, or whatever. Could you imagine getting a bowl from Tommy Chong? That'd be shh, this shit. It would be framed. Yeah. It would absolutely be framed. Get like a 3D frame. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I wonder what his like, email address was to like, order from him. You know what I mean? Like, did they know it was him? You know what I mean? Probably like TommyC48. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. At funny. Gmail. Yeah. <laughs> um, in 2008, Frank Sinatra got his own stamp 10 years after his death. The 42 cent stamp features a young Sinatra in a suit and fedora. Wow, stamps haven't gone up that much because I'm pretty sure I paid like 55 cents for a stamp like a week ago. Music news. We have an update on Woodstock 50. The rumors are swirling on whether or not Woodstock will still be taking place this year. Dentsu Aegis Network, the company behind funding the festival, put out a statement saying the festival was canceled. The statement says, Despite our tremendous investment of time, effort, and commitment, we don't believe the production of the festival can be executed as an event worthy of the Woodstock brand name, while also ensuring the health and safety of the artists, partners, and attendees. As a result, and after careful consideration... Densu Aegis Network, Amplify Live, a partner of Woodstock 50, has decided to cancel the festival. As difficult as it is, we believe this is the most prudent decision for all parties involved. Soon following this statement, Michael Lang, the promoter and driving force of Woodstock 50, basically said they do not have the right to completely cancel this event. Even worse, Lang claims Densu, in quotes, Illegally swept approximately seventeen million from the festival bank account, leaving the festival in peril. That's interesting. I mean, he's boldly stating that this company, and he quotes and saying, illegally swept yeah. approximately seventeen million. So there's there's got to be more to this at some point. I mean, he's not going to come out and specifically say illegally unless there's obviously an issue with seventeen million dollars in peanuts. Like you got to do something. Yeah, exactly. About this. So I'm curious. You're definitely going to probably hear more about this going forward. Um, it basically says here, um, on the bright side, Lang says that these recent obstacles have led to a groundswell of support for Woodstock in every conceivable manner, making the prospects of having a successful event a virtual certainty. Um, with Woodstock 50's fate still up in the air, they've taken Instagram to thank the fans for continued support during this emotional roller coaster. Uh, I don't know. I mean, if it didn't happen, I wouldn't be upset. I'm not, yeah, I'm not even I'm not losing any sleep over, yeah. over it, no. Yeah. They they made the same mistake they always do. They over-corporatized the shit out of it. Yep. And, and well, they're the really game, selling the name at this ass. point. Exactly. Yeah. That's all it is. I mean, it. dude, it's like we were talking about with the... It's not in the same spot that it was. No. It's, yeah, they're really, like, losing touch of what's... It's literally just a concert now. It's becoming a money thing. Yeah, it's got it's got a couple of the alumni art. It's got the mm -hmm. alumni artists. So that's the only thing that yeah. really ties it together. But yeah. even besides that, there's... I mean, we talked about the the sets and you know the you know the roster and half the people i don't even know who the hell they are yeah 
Well, that's also, too, I mean, we can't say that because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that listen to some of the music that we're not so familiar with. So leaving the roster out of the picture, it's more so like they're already discussing, you know, financial problems, obviously, with this corporation, Michael Lang, $17 million. I mean, it's becoming a money feud at this yeah, point. Yeah, the, the tickets were going to yeah. be like something like $500 dude. For and three people days, would and pay for it just to say it's Woodstock. Like, it's, well, they're affiliated they with should, that name as a brand Probably, now. but they shouldn't have to. It should be like a thing where, like, if they're going to have a Woodstock anniversary concert, they should be reaching out to artists that are willing to take a major pay cut to do this. Exactly. the point. Um, and put on a good show for fans for cheap yeah. that people can afford to go to, and it would be it would draw a ton of people. Like exactly. Like the original mm-hmm. one did, not fucking... Yeah, because, I mean, Woodstock was obviously a movement. It was a purpose. It wasn't yeah. just, you know, an opportunity for a festival. Like, you can go to fucking Coachella and Red Rock if you want to do some shit like that. I mean, this is... I mean, again... I, for, for the roster's sake, I mean, again, as we were discussing, we didn't know many of the artists, but leaving that out of the mix, I mean, it's just some of these artists, I'm sure, were asking for more money than you would think, and they're kind of losing point. Of course. Point they're of, probably saying, yeah. it's Woodstock, dude. You guys are going to make tons of yeah, money. Yeah, if you want me exactly. to play this show, I mean, it's, I mean, it just sucks, but I, again, I could honestly give a fuck about this show. Angels and Airwaves announced their first tour in seven years, and they drop a new song. Uh, the band had been dropping hints and teasing about a new song for weeks. They finally dropped the first song in three years, titled Rebel Girl. Along with this new song came the news of their first tour in seven years. Tickets are on sale now. I thought his whole thing was he didn't want to do music anymore. Who? Um, Tom DeLong. Yeah. I saw an article about the band, like its history of him, why he started it and stuff. They had a couple good that songs in the yeah, first I, album. Yeah, and it's funny because... I was a huge Tom DeLonge Blink-182 fan. Yeah. Like, I don't even really like... Not a big Blink-182 fan over here. Not yet. at all. Mm, yeah, no, I think... I, it, like a, I like some of their stuff. Yeah. I had their greatest hits. I had one... I forget which one I had, but I had one of their CDs when Enemy I was a kid. of the State. No, it, I think it was the one after that or the one after that. It was either Take Off Your Pants and Jacket or the self-titled. Yeah. Well, it's funny it with that band. I think uh, it's more of a nostalgia thing because that's yeah. the thing with me and music. I hear a certain artist and it just kind of like brings back vibes and memories as opposed to like me actually listening to the quality of the music. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why I love Blink-182, especially Tom DeLong era. I mean, I, this new shit I haven't even really listened to. I heard a couple of them when they were on the radio, but I don't really like it. I mean, it's just not my style. And Angels and Airways, even so, like... I like Blink-182 with Tom DeLonge doesn't mean I like Tom DeLonge. Yeah. yeah. Like Angels and Airways, for instance, I'm not a huge Yeah, but doesn't fan. Angels and Airways have Travis Barker in it, too? No. No? Plus 44 was Travis Barker and the other dude. Oh, uh, okay. Had Mark up. Hoppus. Yeah, Mark Hoppus. Here's one for you, Steve. We can rejoice. Heavy metal is now the fastest growing genre in the world. <laughs> TuneCore, an online streaming service, has revealed the fastest growing genre worldwide based off their streaming and download numbers for 2018. Rock and rap are not looking good. <laughs> Coming in at number one with a 154% increase was heavy metal. Excellent. I mean, I don't know what they define as heavy metal, but. Yeah, I'm sure that's a really wide base, and I'm pretty sure. Yeah, they it's even, very broad. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they probably even ex- like include extreme metal at that point, like, you know, the mm-hmm. death metal, the black metal, and stuff. I don't know how broad. Shinedown might even be considered heavy yeah, metal. Yeah, I mean, there's so many bands out there where they mm-hmm. could just have the tag as heavy metal, so I think that's super broad. I would like to know more on that. But I mean, that's really interesting because that is a genre that's constantly evolving, but mm-hmm. even the ones that remain consistent, I mean, it's just a very. Certain bands, certain and it's always been the underdog too. Yeah, it's always been the underdog genre. Yeah. Um, number two is J-pop with a hundred and thirty-three percent increase. Number three is R&B and soul with a sixty-eight percent increase. K-pop, fifty-eight percent increase, and B-pop. I'm just kidding. No, uh, world music, (laughs) fifty-seven percent increase. And number six, instrumental, 42% increase. Here's a question. Do you guys ever listen to just instrumental sometimes? Love it. Yeah. John Petrucci, Liquid Tension Experiment, mm-hmm. I have this new orchestra. Oh, yeah, I love a lot of just instrumental bands. I, I like listening to instrumentals. Like yeah. um like you listen to like um like guitar backing tracks without the vocals and yeah, stuff. Yeah. Like, dude, I love listening to that shit. I listen to like Miles Davis. I mean, like that's like the instrumental shit I listen to. I like Miles Davis. Mm-hmm. 
So I just wanted to mention something. I just got a breaking news update here. Blink-182 is touring with Lil Wayne. What? Yeah, I saw that. Saw that? Yeah, I saw a meme that was like <laughs> the, the girl laying in bed. What is he thinking about? Like, I wonder if it's other girls. And then the dude's like looking at his phone or whatever. And it's like, why the fuck is Blink-182 touring with Lil Wayne? Laugh out loud. <laughs> Two completely irrelevant people. Yeah, they're apparently playing uh, the June 30th, the uh, Warp Tour that's going on in AC. Both playing that. What? But they got a huge tour set up, man. Virginia Beach, Columbia, Maryland, Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah, dude. They're Rock and rap have a history of getting down. a whole together. nationwide tour going on here. They have a history West. of getting down. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Speaking of getting down, Jack White receives his honorary doctorate for philanthropic work. That's what I'm holding out for. I'm not going back to school. I'm waiting for the honorary degree. You hear that, guys? Support us more. We can all get our honorary yeah. doctorates. Wow. Uh, Jack White, who has co-founded the bands The White Stripes, The Rock on Tours, The Dead Weather, and started his own record label, Third Man Records, is now receiving an honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. White received a degree from Wayne State University for his philanthropic work to revive Detroit. The guitarist helped restore a major park, saved a Masonic temple from foreclosure, and brought attention back to his hometown. Oh, that's why he's getting all this shit. The Masonic temple preservation. He's Illuminati. Of course. <laughs> so obviously how we just um, you know mentioned Jack White with getting his uh, doctorate in humane numbers. I mean, you have so many artists out there that have done so much good and just like kind of stayed off the radar, especially with like quote unquote bad media. I mean, because when they say like any press is good press, even bad press is good press, that's stupid fucking line. I mean, that's not that's necessarily not true. true. I mean, yeah. I know because then it, I I always have these thoughts like when I'm listening to certain artists and they have a background, especially of like crimes, especially of you know total controversial things that they did in their personal life with you know allegations and not even full on convictions, but just the idea of certain artists that have been accused of certain things. Because for instance, the Leaving Neverland documentary that came out through HBO about Michael Jackson. Um, Dude, that is drawn so much more. Co it's constantly like bringing back up, you know, a story that's been ongoing and if, like For I had decades. Yeah, dude, and it's it's amazing because that has really driven home like how fucked up he was as an individual. Well, <laughs> I actually did just. There it does say here court documents obtained by Daily Mail seem to indicate that Robeson's accusations could be false, and Wade Robeson was like one of the child friends of Michael Jackson. Yeah. And he always stuck by Michael Jackson in like the early '90s trial and the early 2000s yeah. trial. And then after he went for this documentary, he like was the big one who like came out and said that he always lied and Michael yeah. actually did abuse him. And it says here that court documents obtained by Daily Mail seem to indicate that his accusations could be false. Yeah. So I mean, you never. Even friggin know anymore yeah but no. that's and this is this is why like the thought process comes in because you think of some of these artists you think of some of the things they've been accused of some of them have been convicted some of them it's just like on the wall and some of them are just like hearsay theory about certain people and because sometimes dude like i'm listening like to thriller or bad or you know off the wall or something like that and for some reason like i never get it across my head that when i'm listening to a specific artist like i put like what they are as a person and the things that have they've done like, I never put them together. I kind of separate, like, the music from the person. Yeah. And never at any point am I sitting there enabling or totally condoning any of the things that they have done. But then that's when you start to ask yourselves, like, why the fuck are you listening to music? Like, are you really that supportive to the idea? Like, I'm going to boycott this artist because of what they did and totally miss the fact that when I hear a certain song, my ears and my brain enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, it's, it's it gets tough. to a certain point where you need to look past that kind of stuff. I mean, because if that was the case, dude, you wouldn't listen to nobody. Yeah. You know, everyone's done fucked up stuff. Yeah, but then that's what like... Dave Grohl done? Well, I mean, I guess Dave Grohl's never really done anything, but that's all, all that we know. Basically that, a saint. Basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of artists like that, though, that really have no tainted background, so to speak. I mean, everybody had, especially like coming up in the '80s, like the uh, you know older artists and stuff. They all have their backstories. Oh yeah, you know, like drunks, you know, drug addicts, just violent. Well, know. like Adultery. David Bowie and Jimmy Page are big ones for me. That, that yeah, I've I've been wrestling with recently. Um, David Bowie took Lori Maddox's 
virginity when she was 14. And he was 25. And he was 25. Yeah. Jimmy Page dated the same girl when she was 14 and 15, and he was in his 20s. Where are the um, parents? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, you yeah. know, I completely forgot, too. Like, even, like, the Ted Nugent thing. Like, yeah. his first wife. She maintains to this wife. day that she was down and she wanted to do it. But there's probably something to say for, you know, they're rock stars. She's a little girl. Exactly. Her mind was altered by this. Like, stuff, honestly, you, know, you think yeah. about it, like, even us, like, we're, like, 26, 27. Would you sleep with a 14-year-old? Absolutely not. Like, not at all. I mean, you have to understand. I mean, again, it's it's one of those things. We didn't grow up in that time. And at no point was that ever acceptable. No. But it's almost like some things are, like, unwritten rules type shit. And that's what's bothersome because a lot of these ways things are looked at today are like completely heinous as opposed to when they were looked at then. It was almost like harmless. Because, for instance, if Jimmy Page was in his 20s today and music was the way it was in the 60s and the 70s and Led Zeppelin was an upcoming artist, if Jimmy Page slept with a 14-year-old... He'd be Led removed Zepp- from Spotify. Led Ze- he would, first of all, he would have been removed from the band. Led Zeppelin yeah, would have gotten would have been fucking no nowhere, dude. <laughs> yep. Nowhere. Same thing with David Bowie. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's a shame because that's again where it's like they have these actual stories. Some of them are hearsay, and then it's like, let me ask you this: Do you listen to David Bowie? No. Do you listen to Led Zeppelin? Yes. Do you like Jimmy Page? Yeah. I mean, how many times do you put Jimmy Page on like your top five guitarists of all time? Well, I'm I, not. I'm just saying in general. You don't have to fucking think of your. Th- I'm just saying in general. You can put him up there as a top guitarist. He's in my top ten. We're not getting specific here, Bill. I, I'm saying I'm just, in general. I just want everyone to know that Jimmy Page wouldn't be in my top five guitar players of all time. That's because he thinks Zach Wilde is better. Unbelievable. At some point, the student has to pass the teacher. God damn it. That's true. That's like saying... We sick. saw you Zach... Get, you get more to call from. You you understand my point? No, what did you just say? You get more to call from if you come later. Exactly. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Me and Connor true. heard Zach Wilde live, dog. It's crazy. He's nasty. I like the bluesier aspect of the old school and the raw. Zach Wilde's vibe. pretty bluesy too. And he's sometimes Don't be too wrong. sharp. Jimmy Page is a great guitarist. Yeah, I don't know. And I here. probably wouldn't be with Bill in rating Zach Wilde over him. That's not a student <laughs> teacher moment for me. So going back to these artists, though, I mean, just look at the list of artists. I mean, Connor. <laughs> I mean, I just kind of want to hear your opinions as well, Bill. I mean, I mean, the the one thing. Well, the the one instance that you know keeps getting brought up, my wife is, you know, so she's not even on the fence. She's she's off the fence. She's like, uh, I don't know how you listen to As I Lay Dying. I don't know how you can after what he did. And that's you know, how I am. Kind Tim Lambesis yeah, tried to hire a hitman to kill his wife. Yeah, I I don't agree with what he did. Not at all. I don't agree with the fact that he claimed it was roid rage and that's why he did it. But you can't disagree that the music that he made with As I Lay Dying or Austrian Death Machine or even the new music that he put out with As I Lay Dying isn't good. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, it sucks that he did what he did. And now that has to now the the members in all of his bands have to live with that. And, you know, now they're going to be scrutinized for this. But I don't feel like I could stop listening to him because of that. You I know? mean, anybody who did something really bad. And then their cop out is that it was Roy Rage. Rage. Is probably a <laughs> s- tremendous douchebag, like unfathomable level. Yeah, I mean, but that, you can say that for a lot of artists, a whole lot of them. Like oh, some of, of the cop outs, anybody who becomes use, snooty, um, basically. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah and it, it's like, just, like what you're saying too. Like just trying to be able. Like, music for me is just so different. I mean, I, I listen to music for like. I can't even really explain it. Like, it puts you in a whole nother place. Like, when they really say, like, music is therapy, music is medication. I mean, sometimes it really is. Like, I can put on a song and, you know, be totally caught up in a moment and just, like, totally change the whole direction of my attitude based on an artist. And then that's the thing. With certain artists that have these reputations, you know, preceding them that are in a totally infamous sense of what they're known for being a total negative connotation, it's hard for me, like, I mean, on a psychological standpoint, I can't just at one point, you know, watch, like, for instance, Leaving Neverland. We're going to go back to Michael Jackson. Watching that, and even with after you reading that fact of, like, the situation with a lot of that evidence may not be true. I mean, regardless of that, this is an ongoing story with him. Of yeah. these crimes, these things he's done. 
but the music video, in a sense, for a thriller, I remember seeing that as a kid and just just really being like, because I was always into like horror and Halloween and just the vibe I got for that in the song in general. It kind of like seeped into my brain, like the little mm-hmm. earwig and it just festers there. And then every time I listen to Thriller, man, every time I listen to Bad, I mean, there's just so many songs by him that I can't just, if I hear Thriller on the radio, I can't be like, turn that off. I don't like Michael Jackson. And just say it because it's like, I don't like the artist and the, you know, the music. It's like, I don't like the person. It's hard. I can't. I don't have an on-off switch just based on people's you know reputations to say I don't fucking listen to it anymore. Yeah, I mean, I also don't feel like it's fair to do that. Like, like to be able to say no, I'm not going to. Yeah, yeah. I guess the final nail in the coffin thing for me for Michael Jackson was a little unfair, considering there's doubts on the allegations. Still, it's not still not proven. And it's regardless of that, because even with like some of the proven stuff with other artists, yeah, you know what I mean. That's it's really hard when you eventually draw the line, because again, and then it's like, do you talk about okay, if I'm listening to his music, I'm supporting. What are you supporting? You know what I mean? Like, are if you it su- comes out that he definitively did it, I will definitively not listen to his ass. And like, I want, the, but that's the thing. I want the explanation because I know at some point you like It'll the song Thriller. Yeah, it, bo- it, it would bother me as I'm listening to it. Like, if my child was abused by someone it would drop yeah, I would, yeah. I, it would make me insane if the whole world millions of people went on loving this motherfucker you know i think yeah, it, no i agree with that I yeah agree and that's that. the thing too because and he, that's basically something someone in finding neverland says but that was like the note yeah. that drove it home for yeah. me mm-hmm. and i think that's the too i think the personal relation especially if the crime itself is very personal to the individual i mean it's totally understandable but for i don't know for me i think i'm just super apathetic dude I really That's am because Finding Neverland, leaving. Yeah, yeah it's, it's leaving. leaving. Yeah, yeah it's, I think there was one called Finding Neverland. It's like a, it's like a Johnny Depp movie or something. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> All right, not that. But like, what I'm saying is, dude, I, I just become so apathetic with the idea because even songs like I've heard several songs, um, you know, that I can totally personally relate to, and it's not even like with my own personal views, like things like cause like when my mother died when I was really little. I mean, the way she died was really. Um, catastrophic to like my life and like I'll hear songs that are in relation to that of like the individual and I just think about um, I, like I don't know dude I just sometimes I just don't care like it's not that I don't care about the person and what they did because I think every single person regardless of what they did I think they should deserve the punishment for whatever crimes they've committed I mean there, never at any point will I draw the line to say like what they did was okay there's no way that I could ever get to that point I agree and that's another thing with music today I think it's weird because I'm not going out and physically purchasing these albums, so at never any point do I feel like I'm actually putting funds into the estate for that artist and actually supporting, you know, their work in that way. But, like, dude, if Thriller comes on, you know what I mean? If Ziggy Stardust comes on, Gene Genie comes on, if any Zeppelin song comes on, I mean, even Elvis is on this list, dude, for dating a 14-year-old. That Zeppelin I have less of a problem with because it's only one out of four. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, because it's just the uh, person involved in the band. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, but that's another reason. Like, how do you draw the line? You know what I mean? Like, I mean, what if you had a daughter that was that age that dealt with somebody like this of, like, consensual, you know, I mean, well, statutory rape, essentially? I mean, well, what about point, in the like, situation of R. Kelly? Yeah, that's another thing. Well, first of all, there's another thing about it. I don't really like R. Kelly's music, so I'm indifferent. No, no, no. I don't like R. Kelly's I music like either. I like R. Kelly. It sucks. My mind's yeah, telling like, me no. It, it sucks that. I mean, like, yeah, and re- that Ignition remix, dude. I remember those songs were coming out when I was going to like my He's middle got school great songs. He does, dude, yeah. but that's another artist that I'm not, like, I never fucking put R. Bump Kelly on my iTunes. Yeah, Bump and grind, Apple son. Music and, uh, I don't know, dude. Like, I got fucking Thriller. I got I Bad. I Fly. Huh? I believe I can fly. Yeah, Any Space Jam. Yeah, yeah, Space Jam. Jesus. Christ. So what are you gonna do? You get what, well, dude? I'm not sitting there saying I don't like R. Kelly. You just I just said, said that. I'm not a huge fan of his music. It's literally <laughs> what I just said. <laughs> the fuck? All right. Well, on. Yeah. What was the problem? I need your opinions, bro. How do you feel about I, the CeeLo Green one? Well, I don't fucking. You don't like Gnarls Barkley? I'm not a huge fan of him either. I mean, but accused of drugging. Oh, here's another artist. It's not on this list. It's kind of recent. Cardi B. Oh, yeah. Cardi B, dude. That bothers me. Now, here's the thing that bothers me. Because, again, Cardi B, I'm never going to sit here and say, you know what, fuck her because I don't like her music. And it's like, you know what I mean? It doesn't bother me a lot because I feel like the people she was drugging were people who were solicitating. uh, Yes, exactly. So, it's kind of like, fuck it. But at the same time. It's like a Robin Hood situation. I mean. uh It's like a Robin Hood situation. Kind of, yeah, like actually, ball part of the game. It's it's Robin just. Hurt. I don't know. I don't know. Like, it's 
she did drug people. Yeah, but and they said Bill Cosby people to the who were getting team. sex work. Yeah. So it's kind of like you fucking played the game you lost type shit. Yeah, yeah. And but that's the thing though. It's because again, when the the allegations first came out and how she just like flat out admitted it, it's almost like that kind of drives a fan base to like come out and either say what she did was fucked up. Or they support her, and she actually got more support than anything about what she was doing. And again, like you're mentioning, just because of the circumstance of how and why she was doing this, again, it is what it is. Like if you go out there and do drugs, and you go out there and get robbed as a result or overdose as a result, you played the game. Like you yeah. knew the risks yeah, exactly. that you were taking, you know. And again, for her circumstance, it's just the idea because now you're kind of the. Face They're all of- bigger than her, probably. The like the dude she was drugging. Yeah, like, she could have just gave him sedatives so that she, they would fall asleep, and then she would be able to leave yeah. safely. But then you that's know, again where you like come that. into like the morality. But then I heard she also robbed them. That's what I heard too. So then that's that's where like it bothers me. Well, that's what I'm saying. Then it comes not- into like the morality. There's this moments again where you hear all these stories and you start to develop opinions on specific artists. Um, especially in her case being very popular at this present moment. And it's also like the artists that we mentioned that had previous accusations that were very popular in their time. And now some people will stop listening as a result. Some people will start to form opinions as a result and boycott the music again as a result. And my idea is, is like there's so many levels of controversy, you know, with crimes and then just the person's personal life. Like even a lot mm-hmm. of artists, you know, that committed suicide and, you know, what does that mean? And like the artists that, you know, had drug abuse history and especially being the nation being in an opioid epidemic and people not wanting to support the artists. Because who, I mean, there's just so many levels of yeah. like, how do you judge an artist and why do you judge an artist and where do you get to a point and when you stop listening to their music as a result of their personal life? Yeah, you could see like a mom who had their kid overdose on heroin and like, why are yeah. you listening to Kurt Cobain? Yeah. It was probably the album Dirt by Alice in Chains that caused this. Yeah. You know I, mean? I mean, even look, remember when Eminem came out, dude? Oh, my God. My yeah. parents were on unbe- Oh, like, yeah. My oh mom my, hated my Eminem when he came out because he basically me, yeah. advocated beating women. Oh, my God. Yeah. You know? I mean, even like a more extreme example, like people not accepting uh, Freddie Mercury when he came out as bisexual in the, yeah. in the height I of mean, Queen's career. Yeah, that. that like made it really hard for Queen to yeah. just yeah. do their thing when. You know, they should but it's something so irrelevant. Yeah. Like, and if you saw the movie Bohemian Rhapsody, you get to see that moment of pressure. I mean, because you're watching the buildup of this band, and there's this um, you know, two minute scene where the band's actually being interviewed. The entire band's on the platform, and everybody's asking Freddie questions about his personal life. And it, it like, why did it fucking matter? It the should, guy wasn't like, it didn't you know what I mean? That's and, and that's the crazy part. But that's also, too, when we talk about the time that we're in. I mean, that's in the 80s, obviously, you know, with, like, the AIDS epidemic and the way that disease is coming well, out. Well, it was and, just more conservative towards sexual uh, identity. Yeah, and it's, again, and, it's like, that's where I'm saying. When you have a band up there on a platform, like, why do you give a fuck about his personal life? You know what I mean? If you're listening to the music, the music's doing well, why do you give a shit? And, like, especially when you have the band up there to be asking questions, why are you asking this one? Because there's a point, like I said in the movie, where even Freddie is, like, kind of disassociating and being like, I thought we were here for a Queen interview. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. It's not like if uh, Eddie Vedder goes to an interview, they're like, so, like, not now when he's married, but when he was, like, 25 or whatever, so... Dating any girls lately? Yeah, How How's the, uh, how's the love circuit going? Exactly. Yeah. So then I kind of want to say, I mean, you kind of establish like this hierarchy of, you know, artists that have committed, you know, and actually been convicted or, you know, it's now factual. Yeah, but some of them are like actually factual in the things that they've done. You know, then you have artists that have been just accused and it's speculation and now you kind of give them a bad rap because it's just like a shadow follow. Artists who made like bad personal choices like drug. Yeah, 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 and then also whoever. just even like personal preferences with the way they live their life in the scale of like Freddie Mercury, for instance, mm-hmm. Elton John, and artists like that. And um, so, like, I mean, obviously, even just, like Prince, who is like yeah, more feminine, but he yeah. was just like metrosexual, I'm, I'm, though, right? Yeah, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that was like not that it should matter. Different in no. the '80s, you know? No, again, in, yeah. And so I just, I mean, Bill, like, I just want to hear your you know input on like where do you kind of like draw that line? Like, where do you feel? And if you feel it at all, I mean, you can... Yeah, I don't feel like there should be a line. Like, honestly, I mean... I feel like the artist should be separated from, you know, whatever they're doing. I I don't feel like... 
You know, for instance, we'll go so back no to... no line, like, yeah. Michael Jackson's guilty, you have no problem... I have no problem listening to his music. Yeah, it's Because just- I don't feel like his music was affected by his personal decisions. I mean, obviously, in some cases, that's different, like Kurt Cobain or Lane Staley, Jerry Cantrell, you know, stuff like yeah. that. That's different. But I do not feel like I could sit here and go, you know what? Fuck Michael Jackson. I'm never listening to him again. Yeah. I, I don't feel like I don't feel like as a music fan I could do something like that because I there's I don't know him personally, you know? Mm-hmm. Like if he was a piece of shit and like I knew him, he'd be like, Okay, well that's a different story. I'm just not gonna support your stupid ass. But mm-hmm. I don't know him personally and these are only accusations. He's never raped me. You know? How do you feel? For about me, it? I draw the line probably at after personal decisions like uh, like actual accusations of convictions. Yeah, but proven. Like proven. Yeah, like actual like, like um, facts. Like you're never gonna eat does again. Something that hurts somebody else. I guess you know yeah. what I mean. Like then, crimes against humanity. Like yeah, like sex crimes or yeah. murders yeah. or what, whatever. You know. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's where I draw the line. I don't know. What yeah, I mean, Steve? yeah. For me, it's like I said. It's like I kind of agree more so with Bill. It's like the apathetic value towards you know the crimes they've committed. Um, again, I mean, even if it's factual based, it's just hard for me. Like, I don't have that on off switch in my brain to all of a sudden say, I don't like this song. I don't like this music. And I'll just find something else to listen to. That's, yeah. I just, yeah. I mean, majority of the artists too that have even been put on that platform. Cause then I have to start thinking about artists that I listen to like on repeat. You know, for instance, like if it came out, you know, five years later that Kurt Cobain was accused of something back in whatever year and then it was found. You know, yeah. proven that he actually did so I'd like I mean you gotta think of the artists that you listen to religiously I mean it's easier mm-hmm. to disassociate from artists that like you have like you know like a, a love or hate thing like it's kind of just mm-hmm. like whatever I can take or leave it because Michael Jackson I, I don't That's tend to go point. out of my way yeah. to listen to Thriller I don't go out of my way to listen to Bad you yeah. know, but then there's so many artists like the Misfits, for instance. If like, like I love the fucking Misfits. Like I don't, I could never see myself in a world based on something that any of those artists have done. Just done listening to the music. I couldn't do it. No. Yeah. Like no. I don't think I could ever not listen to Van Halen. I don't yeah. think there's anything that any of those guys could do. I mean, I mean, even like Pearl Jam. I mean, all those bands. Yeah. All right. Well, back to Eddie Vedder and Pearl Jam. Oh, speaking of which, you guys want to jump into the Pearl Jam twenty uh, discussion? Yeah. Um. Uh. It's like we said last week, uh, Pearl Jam 20 is a rockumentary directed by Cameron Crowe. It, it really, yeah. You Cameron know? Crowe really, I th- there was like thousands of hours of footage he called from for this. Like, yeah. they re- him and Pearl Jam really worked together. A bunch of live footage, came out. studio footage, everything. It, it, I mean, I'd probably go out on, out on a limb and say this was better than back and forth. Pearl After Jam watching it again. It's probably my favorite. Rock yeah. Henry ever made. I agree with that. I, I really, really, really enjoyed it. I thought it was great. They got a lot of points right. Maybe you know. like the last waltz beats it or something it's like a that. Good one too. But um it's ten out of ten for me. There's really nothing wrong with it. Like I'm not even the biggest Pearl Jam fan anymore per se. Yeah. I still listen to them maybe like once a year, but um that's a really good movie, rewatching it. Um I'm just an avid Pearl Jam fan. Like basically anything after ten, I haven't really given it like an actual true. You're listen. not a huge Versus fan. Yeah, wow. I can't say I'm I a, think you would like Versus. Yeah, versus I can't say I do or like, don't like it because I've never listened to it front to back like yeah, a half wow. ten. You really should. That's a, that's like that's I don't know, man. I th- you probably like Vitology even. Like, I think you would like Versus better. Stuff on Vitology you wouldn't <laughs> like, but. Well, it's, I don't know, like, in my head, it was just, like, one of those things, like, 10 was so perfect. Iconic. Too. Yeah, like, how are they going to top 10? Yeah. And then, you know, yeah. like, I've heard, like, just, um... They're so good that they made 10 that they can't ever make another album decent? <laughs> no, they can't make an 11 or 12. So you're telling they me after Bleach that Nirvana just couldn't do any better? After what? Bleach. <laughs> well, no, because never mind. it would be Nevermind. Well, 10 was the first Pearl Jam album. Well, I mean, sort of, if you want to say Pearl Jam, but you think about, like, Mother Love Bone or Temple of the Dog. So you're saying, like, Slayer, like, Raiden, Temple that's, like, their Dog first album? Recorded. Well, oh, if, if know, Slayer man, never did anything time. after Raiden Blood, I think that would be a pretty valiant attempt for them. And it's, like, the same thing with Pantera. 
Like, is anything before Cowboys from Hell relevant? No. <laughs> well, well, no. I love power metal, too. It was the other metal jungle or something. Metal, Junk. Ma- metal magic or something. Uh, ma- yeah, magic. Jungle. I don't remember. It's like a panther. No, no. Th- there's um, metal magic, and then there's something in the jungle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But power metal was that first yeah. one. But yeah, back to Pearl Jam with... Um, <laughs> they got- Dive into Pantera yeah, for a minute. Like, I mean, it's just the idea, because again, like with... Uh, like, I'm a huge fan of 10. I'm a huge fan of Versus Vitology. I'm a huge fan of... Um, did you like Backspacer? Not really. No? It's all right. I would give it maybe like... That had the fixer on it. Four fixer and a half it. stars yeah, out yeah. of ten, yeah. maybe. Yeah, like, it's, it's not, not completely bad. terrible. And like four and a half out of stars out of ten sounds bad. But yeah. for me, it's really not. Like yeah. That's an album I'll still listen to. That's what I'm saying. Even a, any artist, yeah. like if I give something a two-star rating, it's probably still worth a listen. Yeah. I mean, it would have to be like, I don't even fucking like it. Zero is like... Or half like star. under one is like, this is... Half completely star. terrible. Yeah, don't even waste your time. <laughs> but the, I don't know. Like, well, I maybe, feel like anything like with five stars, like anywhere around five or half, is still good. There's yeah. like three songs I like on it. On oh, what? Uh, Backspacer. Backspacer. Yeah. So it's kind of like I do maybe like four, and it's and they're not like songs I really like. So it's like I don't know. It's hard, but it's not a terrible album. It's just not a really good album. Yeah. And, you have to give it that kind of review then, well, I guess. Well, back to the movie here. Um, if we were to do our, uh, you know, our RETM podcast score-o-meter, what would you give this movie out of 10, Steve? I'm probably, like, right on point with, like, the critics. I would give it a 6.5, probably. Out of 10? I don't want to give it a 7. Yeah, because, again, it's... What? Th- this is the reason why. It's like with live footage rockumentaries, it's almost just like I get the opportunity to see things that I can read about, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I want to see, like, real... Oh, inth- like, for instance, like, I'm more into, like, the biopics. Like, for instance, like, when we mentioned Control, like, the Doors movie. I mean, I, I didn't like the dirt, but, like, the style of it. I don't know. I get more interested when you get to see actors in, like, the movie itself. Like, when okay, I see, yeah, I'm I, kind I, of, I, I like this because this was, like... It was like that, but it was them, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, know, again... Like, it, I don't know. I think so much old footage, mm-hmm. like the scene with Kirk Cobain and Eddie Vedder dancing was fucking crazy. Yeah. Um, their reaction after the the stuff in uh, the concert in the early two thousands, where there was the deaths. Oh yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was heavy, you know. And yeah, like, but again, you even got the Andy their Wood actual stuff. reactions to all this stuff, and not actors. Yeah, trails. but again, with the six and a half, I'm saying it was good. I wasn't blown away. That's the difference. Like, I, it, I think it takes a lot of just there's certain things to, like, blow me away. When I say a six mm-hmm. and a half, I'm not even just putting it on the genre base. I'm just putting it, obviously, anything music sense. I'm adding that into, obviously, biopic films that are, like, filmed with actors as well as documentaries. I mean, even, like, the Flight 666, six, 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 Flight 666, six, six, the Iron Maiden one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even up there with that. Like, I'm, like, I like that, but I'm not a huge fan of that either. I don't know what it is with, like, the rockumentary style stuff where it's actual footage. I think sometimes I like to be able to see stories that, like, I heard about and actually wanted to see on film. Like the gritty, like shit that you'd see behind the scenes, like written in books and things you've heard about. True, yeah, that stuff's not. You know what I mean, I mean, it's kind. Of, uh, yeah, it wasn't a movie that was supposed to be like that. That really, I feel like it was supposed to be yeah. like a, for mostly about the good parts of Pearl Jam. Well, that's like, what I'm saying. Like you get the information, kind of you get to see movie. cool yep. stuff, but it's almost like when you watch documentaries on wars and stuff like that. Um, that stuff I like to see because you'll never see that, and you can obviously, you know, when you see acting movies, I'm like different with Rocky Matters. Like I like to see the acting, mm-hmm. I like to see like somebody go out there and portray a moment that you've only read about. Yeah, I agree. You know what I mean, because yeah, like live shows, you saying. can see, you know, obviously behind the scene footage of like moments that you couldn't see. It's impactful to see those things happen. But again, like I want to see, like for instance, if we were talking about like Kurt Cobain, like him overdosing after the Saturday Night Live show, like I would like to see that moment acted in portrayal because these are like again. Moments that you'll never be able to see. Yeah. Like you have no footage of these things, mm-hmm. you know? And it's just the idea of, like, holy shit, this actually happened. Yeah, I mean, like, in a perfect world, there would be a camera following around everybody we need to, to catch, like, this. I don't know like, about that perfect world. Like, six and a half rating. Like, you guys didn't even fucking rate the movie yet. I gave it, it a just, ten. What are you talking about? You started I right away, though. Out. We didn't start, like, all right, out of this, like, he just mentioned, like, the rating meter. That's why I want to go back, and then you're going to say the ten again. Because right, that was just kind maybe- of briefly mentioned. It's hard because I've only seen like four or five movies like this that are like straight up rock documentaries. Like, yeah, you know what I mean. So maybe like if I had to give it like a movie rating, yeah, like put it on a basis of like if I just everything. reviewed it the same way I'd review like Control. Yeah, the um, worst movie. Yeah, um, yeah, I guess maybe like a seven out of ten. Yeah, I mean, 
Because it it's just like seven and a half. Away. Yeah, Man, yeah. Dude. I'll, I'll say seven point two. Oh, fair enough. I'll take that. Yeah, it's good. And you said six and a half. Six and a half. So yeah. we got six point five, seven point two, and what do you think, Bill? So we're at thirteen point five right now. Well, if you average it, we're at like six point eight or nine yeah, or whatever. We're at thirteen point five, so we're at about a six point seven ish. Yeah. All right, we're gonna pull this one up a little bit. I'm gonna give the movie an eight. Okay. I, my thing is, I mean, it's just like what you were saying with, like, like you wish that there was like more footage, so it could, uh, so the story could be more. I, I like, I, I, if it had more of that, I probably would have given it a ten. Yeah, it was a great watching experience, honestly. What like, I really enjoyed is really how they enjoyable. how they talk about Mother Love Bone, and then how they yeah, talk yeah, about Temple of the important. Dog. And honest to God, before I watched this movie, I had no idea that um, Temple of the Dog was Eddie Vedder's first ever recording. Yeah, like you know, Hunger yeah. Strike was the first time that dude has ever been, anyone ever heard that dude's voice on a CD or yeah. a record or tape was that song. Yeah, like could you imagine buying that tape? And, like, you hear, like, Chris Cornell, then all of a sudden you hear Eddie Vedder for the first time. You're like, holy fucking shit. Yeah, who's that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Who is this guy? And Where am I going to hear him next? Yep. Like, it, it, and, like, like look, with the hair stand up my arms, because, like, that part of the fucking movie, dude, is just crazy. They're like, yeah, and then he showed up in the studio, and, oh, I don't yeah. mind. It's just, yeah, it dude, it was out. nuts. Temple of the Dog came out, like, four or five months before, uh... Ten. Ten, yeah. yeah. I think that is cool, too, because like you were saying, with the idea of seeing some of these moments of, like, you know, history with these artists, because, again, with music, history is, like, almost, like probably sometimes more impactful me than, like, actual history. Like, just hearing how these artists came on the scene. Yeah. But, again, like, that's why, for me, it's just me and you differ with the idea. Like, I like to be able to see the moments portrayed that you've only heard about. Like, that, there literally would be no found footage of, because it was just personal, intimate moments with, like, the artist doing something either controversial or something important that you would have to see active, because there was no camera on them at that point. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, when you see a lot of this found footage, I mean, some of it is backstage, where they just happen to be filming something, you know, at that moment. And I'm not saying backstage on a show, I'm just talking about, like, backstory in their lives. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of it with the live footage and stuff. I mean, most of it you can obviously see. But again, I think it is cool when you get to see some impactful things that, again, you've only read about. But again, to see some shit that like you'll never see. Yeah. Just act it and understand, like, holy fuck, I can't believe that actually happened. Yeah. Well, it's actually funny, too. Like, uh, like we gave this movie, actually, I believe, a better rating than we gave back and forth. And um, this movie actually has real reviews from credible <laughs> sources. <laughs> like, the Los Angeles Times says, By the time Pearl Jam 20 is over, we can't help but be impressed by the kind of personal and professional integrity that has kept this band honest and allowed them to endure and prosper. Pearl Jam 20 may not create new fans, but for existing fans... It is an exceptional musical experience. That I think that's pretty spot on. Yeah. yeah. The way that's described. Exactly. Um, it's a huge missed opportunity on Crow's part in his attempt to show the best traits of a band he is obviously very enamored with. He's wound up with a pretty lackluster film. I don't know if I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, that's. Eric I thought the one right before yeah. that and saying it's exceptional as opposed to lackluster. I've never even heard of ScenesStealers.com, by yeah, the way. You've never heard of Scene Stealers, bro? No. Have you? Nope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like we have a good thing going on here with these uh, biopics, rockumentaries. I feel like for the next week, we are suggesting to you, our loyal listeners and fans, to check out the 2015 movie Straight Out of Compton. I'm excited to watch this one. It's never a very. Oh, you never saw it. No. You never saw Straight Outta Compton. No. Oh my it's good, god! Man. Especially too, because you've been like recently listening, Connor, to a lot of like Public Enemy and shit. Mm -hmm. This is yeah, it's a really good in depth look, especially because Straight Outta Compton, that album itself, like when that came out, dude, that's an absolute landmark and like. Oh yeah, nah, I know the music. Dude, I just especially. never saw the movie. Yeah, yeah, but I'm saying you get to really see because this is yeah. one of those movies I'm talking about where you get to really see things portrayed. Yeah, yeah. Heard stories about, and you get to kind of get well. The and Straight Outta Compton kind of seems like the best of both worlds because um. It's like Pearl Jam 20, where it was like in house, like mm -hmm. a lot of people close to NWA and in NWA were involved in the making. Yeah. And, yep. but then it's, it has actors for trials. And rest in peace to the late great Nipsey Hussle. He plays Snoop Dogg in the film. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. Oops. Ice Cube's son, O'Shea Jackson Jr., plays his father, Ice Cube. Really looking forward to this. Dude, it's good. It's good, man. It's All very, right. very good. So, uh, what do we got for personal suggestions? We'll start off with Steven on this one. 
Um, so recently, I got into a semi-newer band. The band is called Red Fang. They're kind of like... Um, I mean, honestly, if this band came out in the 70s, they could be like a hard rock opener for Black Sabbath. They got that kind of stoner metal, doom metal, clean vocals, just heavy rock sound. Um, their self-title is excellent. It's called Red Fang. It came out in 2009. And then they have the uh, Murder in the Mountains album, which is the recommendation. Uh, it's by Red Fang. It came out in 2011. Definitely recommend that. That's cool. I, I, you showed me a little bit of Red Fang earlier. Yeah, and, uh I, I definitely want to check them out a little bit more. I'm probably going to throw them on my Spotify. Yeah, they're excellent. I really, really enjoyed it. I have them on Apple Music. Shout out to iTunes. <laughs> my, uh, my suggestion this week is to check out the new single, Something to Hold On To, from the Memphis group, The Band Camino. I went and saw uh, Ben Rector um, last year last summer and uh he had this band opening for him and uh when i heard them i was like there's no way that a three piece can do this and uh there's an insanely good group very very tight young kids they're from memphis they they got plenty of other songs on spotify and whatever but this is their newest single and you should go check it out i think it's pretty good it's worth a listen Okay, I'm uh, recommending Texas rock band True Riddos as high as the highest heavens and from the center to the circumference of the earth by True Widow. Um, they're like kind of stoner rock, shoegaze. Um, I got into them from their song Skull Eyes, which is from that album. Really great band. They've toured with um, Annual Nose by the Trail of Dead, Boris, Curvile, Surfer Blood. Yeah, they, they've been around since 2007, but... They're, they've never really got too. The name or sounds anything. familiar. I, I can't say I I have listened to them, but I've heard that name before. True widow. All right, guys. Well, thank you for another Monday of hanging out with us three. Um, we'll be back down here in the basement next Monday to give you all another brand new podcast. Once again, we like to thank you all for listening to us on iTunes. Thank you for helping us get here. Uh, continue to. Have all of your friends subscribe and rate us, comment on us, tell us what you think. Head over to our Facebook page, uh, Rage Against the Mainstream Podcast. Head on over to our Instagram, our Twitter, at R-A-T-M Podcast. Um, that's it for me. Um, I'm Bill. I'm Connie. Steve. This is Rage Against the Mainstream signing off. Have a good night, everybody.